I'm Kristen Berenson. I'm a postdoctoral fellow in Dev Manoli's lab at UCSF. Today, I'm going to talk to you about relationships. We're all aware that social bonds form the fabric of our personal lives and of our society. As a physician, I'm acutely aware of the dramatic disruption in social function that can occur across most neuropsychiatric diseases. From the inability to develop social relationships in autism, or the social withdrawal that's common in young adulthood with schizophrenia, to the profound social isolation that is so common to dementia and depression. And yet we have no interventions for these symptoms. I wanna demonstrate that social attachments are behaviors that we can understand at a neurobiological level, and that doing this is essential to improving human health. The experience of being alone is something familiar, and generally aversive for most people. Not only is loneliness a profound and particularly human experience, it has dramatic effects on our health and well being. In fact, social stress and isolation are not only a potential symptom, but increasingly thought of as a significant risk factor for mental illness. The fact that we as humans care about isolation and experience loneliness says something important about our ability to connect, to form relationships. But how do we begin to study the neurobiology of relationships? When we think about what's happening in the brain when attachments are disrupted due to disease or environment, we lack a detailed map of the circuits and cells that act to encode these attachments in the first place. This may be because none of the commonly used genetic model organisms display adult attachment behaviors. In order to figure this out, I started to think about what other animal species have evolved these more complex relationships besides humans. Prairie voles are a rodent species. They form long-term social bonds with mates, with peers, with offspring. If presented with their partner or with a stranger of the opposite sex, prairie voles will spend a majority of their time huddling with a partner and rejecting the stranger. Both females and males care for their offspring. This type of social monogamy is exceptionally rare, making prairie voles an ideal and unique model system by which to study adult attachment behavior. And as a corollary to studying attachment, this model also provides a very useful way to study isolation and loneliness. Conveniently, there are very closely related species that don't form these unique attachments. Meadow voles are a promiscuous species. They don't demonstrate any of the pair bonding or familial care that prairie voles do. And importantly, they spend most of their time in isolation, similar to over 80% of animal species. We can compare the brains and behavior of these animals when presented with isolation from mates or peers. And this then becomes a very powerful way to study the basic neurobiology of loneliness. If an animal cares about who they've partnered with and something in the brain has changed to register this, they should also care when that attachment is broken. And we should see a very specific response in the brain. Isolation serves not only as a relevant social context, but a very useful way to probe the attachment circuit that is formed. We can look not only across the brain regions and populations of neurons that behave differently in the brains of these two species, but at the genetic pathways that have evolved to drive these differences in the first place. I now have an environmental manipulation that is extremely salient for one species and not for the other, and in a way that mimics the response of humans to isolation. Comparing these two species provides a map of where to look in the brain, but it doesn't tell us how areas of the brain produce such different behaviors. Traditionally, work in voles has been limited because we haven't had the tools to genetically manipulate these animals. We know that certain molecular and neuroendocrine pathways act across development to modulate social behaviors. And specific genes are associated with diseases of attachment, like autism. We've done pioneering work to adapt molecular genetic tools to the voles. Using these highly efficient and precise gene editing techniques 
we've successfully generated mutants for known neuropeptide receptors and the first foals bearing mutations in autism risk genes, granting us a foothold into understanding early social behavior. I'm now using these same techniques to begin to probe diseases that occur across the lifespan and into late age. I've generated a novel model system for studying social relationships using the prairie bowl. Having a model of social isolation now gives me an entry point into understanding the broader questions of adult attachment. I can expand on these tools to examine a multitude of neuropsychiatric diseases that are characterized by altered social behavior and that are profoundly impacted by isolation. As a physician, I want to understand attachment deficits in disease and to develop interventions for these devastating conditions. Millions of people around the world are suffering from dementia and from depression, and these numbers are only expected to increase. We need new ways of thinking about mental health. We haven't before had the, the tools and the ability to examine deficits in social attachment and to really look at the health impacts of loneliness. Having an animal model that shows long-term adult attachment and is genetically tractable is a groundbreaking advance. This will open the door to new ways of conceptualizing neuropsychiatric disease and ultimately to developing new therapies for our patients.